Um, the next talk is actually has three uh, presenters. It's on OSPR field data collection tools. Um, the authors are uh, Guppy Gustafson, who is a senior GIS specialist on my team. Unfortunately, uh, unforeseen circumstances, Guppy can't be with us today. So I'm making a last minute substitution and I will substitute for Guppy. Uh, I'm Judd Muscat, I'm senior environmental scientist uh, at OSPER. I'm the GIS lead, the GIS coordinator. I've been with OSPER for 27 years, uh, doing GIS for oil spill response uh, the entire time, building a GIS uh, uh, preparedness a preparedness oil spill GIS and uh, and uh, overseeing the development of uh, of some of these applications, well, all of these applications that you're gonna you're gonna hear about right now. The other authors are uh, Diana Grosso. Uh, Diana is a senior, also a senior environmental scientist. Uh, she's a field response uh, responder uh, on our Central California uh, field response team. Uh, Diana's been with OSPR for five years. Uh, before that, she was uh, a contractor, essentially doing the same thing, uh, wildlife issues and, uh, and stat. And the third author is uh, Jeannie Hawkins. And uh, Jeannie is with the Oiled Wildlife Care Network, which is part of uh, University of California, Davis. Um, she's a field operations specialist. Uh, her current position, she manages all of OWCN's field equipment locally as well as throughout the state. And she's part of the initial team on site for wildlife recovery during oil spill events in California. Okay, now I am gonna try and share my screen here. I am not one of those who went through a uh, demo. And Adam, where is that uh, video? Uh, aha, got it. Optimize video. How's that? Share. Are you seeing my screen? Somebody respond? Yes, but it's not in presenter mode. Okay. Okay, now it is. Um, I'm looking at a different screen, so you're gonna see the side of my head, I guess. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about the uh, our field data collection tools. Uh, here are the authors. Like I said, unfortunately, Guffy couldn't be here. And these are the uh, the, the data collection apps. Uh, three of these are totally customized and developed by OSPR. Uh, and and one is off the shelf, the uh, the uh, ESRI's uh, Survey One Two Three. Um, and this is just a sample map from our catalog output. And I'm going to move on. The first thing I'll talk about is Otter Spotter. This is used by uh, our otter specialists on their, uh, they use it during their, uh, their surveys. Um, they do uh, regular surveys, although this past year with COVID, they have not been regular at all. Uh, nonetheless, they have this application. It's, it was written in iOS uh, and, and that's political. We, we can only use uh, Apple uh, mobile devices, tablets and phones. Uh, yeah, uh, and so we're limited to that, and but that's not a problem. Uh, this particular uh, app was designed for the full size uh, iPad Pro. Um, it gives you plenty of real estate, and it's easy to manipulate uh, when you're in a bouncy aircraft. So there's large buttons to uh, input uh, various parameters for their surveys. Um, they see a map as they're flying. These are their proposed flight lines and you can see uh, their observations along uh, the way. The way they do this is they have, uh, they have, uh, they have two, two observers, one on either side of the aircraft and you know, they're looking in certain directions and, uh, and all that. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a good tool for data collection and should there be a, uh, a response on the central coast of California, we're certainly going to do uh, otter surveys, and this is the tool they will use. Okay, the off-the-shelf surf uh, so, uh, software survey one two three. Um, this is something that uh, Guffy has been uh, working with. Uh, you know, like I said, it's off-the-shelf, but it's customizable. It's uh, it's fairly simple. You know, you you collect a, a data point, a track line, and a photograph. 
Uh, we've been using it for uh, the development of our geographic response plans in the inland area uh, for pretty much mapping out uh, riverbank access. Uh, we've used it, uh, we use it uh, for updating our uh, area contingency plans uh, for the marine environment, uh, you know, for uh, shoreline access points, and um, it works out very well. Um, it, it, you can upload from uh, Survey123 right into ArcGIS online, and then it becomes uh, enterprise data. Um, and you, so here it is in uh, ArcGIS online. And then you can create histograms and, and tables and of whatever you need out of the data. Scatalog. Okay, I'm going to talk about Scatalog. As far as I'm concerned, it's the most important tool we've ever developed. Uh, those of you who have, have been to large responses and have sat in a scat unit or a GIS unit, uh, you know what a nightmare it is uh, to receive. Uh, forms, paper forms for multiple SCAT teams at the end of the day when they're tired, when you're tired, and you have to transcribe all that data, digitize it into the GIS. Uh, there's a lot of room for transcription errors. Uh, there's language barriers even. Uh, during Deepwater Horizon, I worked with a, a team from, uh, from Canada and you know their comments were in French and English. And, I'm only English speaking, so I spend a lot of time knocking on uh, hotel room doors. But uh, Scadlog, uh, it, it, uh, it, it does away with all that, okay? It's, uh, it follows the NOAA uh, shoreline uh, oiling survey form. Uh, it complies with the NOAA data, uh, SCAT data model. Um, the data can be transferred from the field right to the command post, either by, by email, air transfer, or you can just show up with it. Um, and it records uh, like the GIS track, oiling zones, pit trench locations, a sketch, photos and photos. Um, like I said, it, it can come right to, the, uh, right to the command post where we can start processing the data uh, pretty much instantly with a tool set we've developed for uh, uh, ArcGIS. And like I said, it, it is only an iOS but it is available for download. We have it up in the Apple App Store and we encourage those of you to, who will be working in California uh, to get familiar with it because uh, we will be using Scatalog for SCAT data collection on any response in California. Uh, uh, at, least, at least one member of the SCAT team, the OSPR member, which will probably the SCAT team lead, will be using Scatalog and the other team members can, can follow on with their paper forms and then they will all reconcile uh, before the data is actually uh, turned into the, the, to the GIS unit. So the advantages I, I've already mentioned, uh, have the quick access, uh, you know, we can process it pretty quick and provide uh, information on, you know, not in real time, but pretty close to it, to, uh, to operations planning and people who need the information. You know, before we had Scadlog, uh, you know, the, the standard turnaround time was the next day. You know, we had to have the data ready for uh, an 0700 meeting. Um, right now, we, we, it's, it's done the same day and we can put it right up in, uh, in, in the COP, in, the, in whatever it is, be it uh, IRMA, which we will do, or IAP or, or any of those others that are out. And yeah, if you have many SCAT teams, uh, you know, we've had up to seven at one point, they're in Costco, Busan, uh, it's a nightmare. It's a, it, it takes up all the time of the GIS unit. And now uh, it can be handled by, you know, a couple of people. And like I said, now there's, uh, it diminishes the chance of uh, error in transcription from the paper form. And we've developed a suite of tools um, to be used in uh, ArcGIS. Uh, these are also downloaded with the, with the app along with manuals and things like that. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so there's a user guide and all, all kinds of uh, documentation that, that has been written for SCAP. Well, I think at this point in time, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Diana Grosso, who's gonna talk about uh, drones and how we've used them in spill response. And these are off the shelf drones, I wanna. Uh... 
Yeah, yeah. So just go over for the common uses. I included a couple case scenarios, and then I'm just going to dab a little bit into the data processing. Next slide. So we do have some higher end drones, but for the majority of spill response, we use the DJI Mavic 2 Pro and the DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise. Does a little bit more than the Pro. We can get some uh, thermal infrared imagery off of the Enterprise, so that's pretty nice. I'll show you a little bit more on uh, additional slide. And then the applications we use for flying the drone include the the DJI Go 4 for flying the Mavic 2 Pro, and then the DJI Pilot, you have to have a different application because it does do the thermal infrared imagery. And the past we've used drone deploy. So the image on the bottom right um, is an example of drone deploy. We've started using site scan re more recently, which is the same kind of application, but you can um, set a flight path before going out into the field. So predetermined transects, set some parameters of where you want the drone to fly, collect the imagery, and then it just goes autonomously and collects those uh, photos for you. And then HD Sync is a nice app for being able to take all the, um, the data and then take it from the iPad on the drone and, and be able to load it onto the computer. Next slide. So if you've listened to any of the other drone talks, you know there's a wide range of operations for which a drone can be used. But uh, these are the four most common uses for OSPR during spill response. So general recon, um, we get the drone up pretty soon if we can to get an overview of what the spill looks like. Uh, gets a lot better imagery than just taking close-up photos, walking a spill. Uh, we look for any potential ingress, egress restrictions. Are there some good locations for staging equipment? Can we determine where the spill end zone is? Things of that nature. Um, resources at risk. It's one of the things a drone can assist with. Um, as, as the drone's flying around, are you seeing any sensitive habitat that might, might need to be protected? Um, any you know western pond turtles for example basking on on logs that are in, in the spill zone or, or downstream from it uh, any you know potentially nesting bald eagles things of that nature that might need some extra protection that maybe you can't see necessarily by walking the spill site on foot um, shoreline cleanup assess shoreline cleanup and assessment technique that Jed went over. I'll uh, we'll talk about that in an additional slide on how we've used the drone for that. And then just the, the general overall site safety awareness. So are there any low hanging power lines that maybe heavy equipment needs to get around? Are there any overhanging rocks that you, know, you can't necessarily see walking the stream bed, but the drone can home in on those pretty, pretty um, close and, and find if there's any additional safety restrictions, et cetera. Next slide. So this is a case scenario. This was the uh, Huntington Lake release, April 9, 2019. So Osper was dispatched for a report of approximately 400 to 500 gallons of diesel. It was at this parking lot uh, upstream from the lake. It was not known if it had breached the lake yet. As you can see, there's some fuel pumps right there, with a lot of snow deposition. And next slide. Oh, sorry. On the previous slide, I can't really see it. I've got a lot up on here. But um, you can see the sheen going on the road that was leading down to the lake. So we knew that there was a release. We just didn't know how far it went because of the snow. All right, next slide. So another issue was that the lake was partially frozen. So we couldn't get snowmobiles or walk out to look along the edges of the ice. We couldn't get a boat because there was ice and snow at the boat launch. But the responding ES noticed some sort of a reddish brown coloration along the edge of the ice. And one of the tanks did have a red dye diesel. So there was a belief that possibly the lake did get oiled. So this was the first uh, attempt for Osper to um, use the drone for spill response. 
Next slide. So we got the drone out. We were able to get in all the way along the edges of the ice. We noticed a lot of deposition. This is kind of by the inlet to the lake where a lot of sedimentation and, and wood debris came in. So we believe that's what was the staining on the ice. There was no sheen observed at all. And we were able to do a perimeter around the edge. Uh, on the way back toward the end though, the wind gusts picked up to 20 miles an hour. So we found that's a limitation for these smaller drones. They just can't fly well with those kind of wind speeds. So uh, we did cut the very end of that flight short. And it, I believe a, a warden did go out a couple of weeks later when the lake had thawed and did a boat survey and there was no sheet observed. So we did double check just in case there might've been some fuel that had gotten under the snow and we weren't able to observe it during the drone flights. Next slide. So then a month later, we had a surface expression out in Western Kern County where a uh, surface expression started with an initial report of 30 barrels of, of petroleum in a dry waterway. And the release was ongoing. Um, continued into July. Uh, it wasn't safe to access the waterway because there were continual holes appearing with oil bubbling up through it. So this one was kind of difficult because we could not get in to access the stream, look for wildlife, you know, normal measures that OSPR will employ during a spill. Um, so for like any wildlife hazing, et cetera, that all had to be done above the banks on adjacent well pads. So kind of tricky. So we decided we're gonna use the drone in addition to just getting uh, weekly aerial imagery of the spill to kind of document the cleanup, but also to do some wildlife uh, recon as well. Next slide. And this is just an image I included so you can get an idea of the magnitude of the spill. There's a vac truck down there on the bottom right. And those flat well pads up above the banks, that's where we kind of had to, we were restricted for trying to do wildlife hazing and just as far as being able to access, only heavy equipment was allowed down in the stream. Next slide. So again, uh, we use the drone for video. Uh, we, we use it to help document cleanup endpoints as well as the, any wildlife activity within the stream bed just to document any damages to wildlife. And that bottom picture is showing the drone pilot flying and then the company Osper ESs are doing a scat survey from the bank. So we were kind of using the drone to help um, support any evidence seen from the binoculars. And one of the issues though, if you've ever been out to Bakersfield in August is the temperature. We were getting temperatures over hundred degrees. And so even standing under a shade tent, the, the iPad would overheat and go into that emergency shut off mode like your phone does when you leave it in the sun. Uh, we found out by, by standing by the AC running in the truck that that kind of alleviated that problem. Next slide. So as I said, we, uh, we use the drone for wildlife surveys. And this is an example of uh, some wildlife impacts where we observed some trail of, looked like a mammal, something large, crawling through the oil slash mud slash water mixture. And the drone was able to get some close-up imagery. Um, the photo on the right, you can see on the upper right, there's a dragonfly for reference, but pretty large size tracks. We believe this is from a badger. Um, we didn't find a badger stuck in the mud. We didn't see any mammals or anything stuck. So we think it, it kind of drug through and went up the bank. We did have trail cameras out on this spill. We're not able to observe an oil badger though. Next slide. So one of the nice things that the drone does while it's flying is it has spatial data it collects. So the large image shows the path of the drone as it was collecting video and images. 
And that path can be downloaded and then put on top of Google Earth so you can get some spatial, uh, visual spatial of where the, flow, the flight occurred. And then as you look at the video, you can also get lat long. So this really helps for doing scatter log. So on the picture below, you see there's some, some brownish coloration. So that's some weathered oil that we observed with the drone. Um, but we're able to take the lat longs, we're able to fill out the scat paper form, but also provide that location, that image and, and show it to the cleanup crew and say, look, this area needs a little bit more cleanup. Um, can you address this? So it made it really easy to pinpoint any areas we observed that were not quite cleaned up to OSPER standards. So worked really, really well for SCAT when we could not walk the actual street bed. Uh, next slide. And then most recently we had a, a tanker spill off of Highway 166 into the Cuyama River, released approximately 6,000 gallons of crude oil. And if you've ever driven this highway, you know that the limit we're very limited to access of the river. There's a very steep bank on river right. And then the uh, adjacent to the highway is an also a steep bank and there's not much areas that you can park or even get to the stream. And the oil went approximately two miles. So a pretty decent spill for Osper. And this happened right during the deep part of COVID shutdown. So um, we had very few OSPR personnel actually at the site. It was mostly uh, remote UC. So the drone was really helpful for this incident. Next slide. So I just wanted to show you kind of some of the restrictions we had on this one. So the Highway 166 is up on the right. This bank slopes rather steeply and then slopes again. Uh, the other side of the bank is very steep and so we used the drone to, to, you know, also do the general recon, but to look for pockets of oil. Uh, crews were allowed to walk through there, but you couldn't really get equipment down into the stream. Um, and then the photo on the right shows where our oil collection site occurred. So this was behind the U.S. Forest Service station. So there actually was a little dirt road there we had access to. We could get heavy equipment down there and create a dam and oil cleanup occurred right in this area, it worked really well. Um, we flew the drone daily to get imagery for the UC to kind of spearhead operations. And so they could see kind of how it was going, how the cleanup uh, progressed over time and for our PIO so they could get that information out to the public. Uh, next slide. And so this is where Judd's specialty comes in. <laughs> so. We collect all the data and we get it to him and he has to process it, especially for the orthomosaic mapping. Um, most commonly use, uses drone to map and he can do a, a pretty, pretty good map in about two hours, but for the full resolution, um, what they call the, the digital surface model. So you'll get the different topographic kind of layering, sort of like that one down in the, the bottom right takes 10 hours for 600 pictures. So um, this one's the, an example of the thermal infrared. I think that purple is the darker colors. I think that's the truck. And then there's a stream bed down in the bottom left. So you can kind of see a little bit of the topographic relief it shows. And one of the issues that we did have on that recent tanker um, spill was internet connection was very weak. So you're talking a lot of images that are very high resolution. Uh, for that particular spill, we were able to have the warden take the data down to the hotel and then send it on the SharePoint to Judd. So you really, you need strong GIS support and internet connection to get these high resolution images to the UC. Uh, next, next slide. And this is just an example of some of the imagery. So for the surface expression in Kern County, the bottom left, you can see uh, the oiling, you can see uh, some of the lighter gray areas was where the, the surface expressions came to the surface and then they kind of flowed down into the stream. And then we had a, an infrared image 
kind of showing when it's 100 degrees, you can see that oil is really heating up. So the lighter the color, the, the hotter the temperature. And then for the ortho mosaic, mosaic mapping, the big oval image is where we do the pre-planned flights. The drone collects all the data and then someone like Jed takes it, puts it in the program and it stitches it all together. So you get this really nice real-time map of the spill overall view. And that really helped, I think, in UC, so they didn't have to keep going down to the spill location to see how it looked. We could show those maps over time, how it progressed and clean up. And I believe that is it for me, Jed. Okay. Um, I'll turn it over to Jeannie. Hey, everyone, I apologize. I think my talk is going to go longer than what the time allows for this. Um, like Judd said, I'm Jenny Hawkins. I'm the oil wildlife. Uh, well, I'm with the Oil Wildlife Care Network. I'm the field operations specialist. Um, for those of you who don't know who we are and what we do, I'll talk briefly on that and then cover the Wildlife Recovery App, which is the main um, way that we collect data in the field. So if you want to go to the next slide. So the um, Oil Wildlife Care Network, or as we are often referred to, the OWCN, was founded in 1994. Um, it's part of the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, and within that, it's within the Wildlife Health Center. So during an oil spill response where wildlife become impacted, OSPR calls us and activates us to do the capture and care of any oil affected um, animals that are impacted by the spill. And when they do that, we are operating under OSPR's umbrella within the wildlife branch. And so our mission within the OWCN is to provide the best achievable capture and care of oil affected wildlife. Next slide. So um, in talking about the Wildlife Recovery app, um, like I said before, it is an app that we rely on heavily in the field to collect most of our data. It's an iOS app that documents our hazing and recovery efforts, as well as our trail camera locations and any other general observations in the field that we make that we want to document. The really awesome thing about this app is that it, it uh, runs off satellite, so no cell service is required. It also allows us to take photos and scan QR codes, which is really important for us because the QR code um, is assigned to the animal we collect in the field, and that's its identification. So it's important for us to be able to um, attach that information to its record. Um, it, the app also allows us to transfer data from the field to an OSPR server. And that, that data is then accessed by OSPR staff and their GIS team, as well as the Oiled Wildlife Rehabilitation Medical Database, um, known as OWERMED. And this database is used in the care facilities to track patient care from the time we captured in the field to the time that it's released. And the app also allows us to create maps of all of our surveys and all of our data point collections. Next slide. Um, so I put together a quick video, it's about five minutes long, that walks through how the Wildlife Recovery app works um, and all the different data points and types of information we can collect with it. So if you want to play that video. Once we open the app, we need to create our survey. So we enter the survey name, the initials of everybody on our team, the organization, whether it's CDFW or OWCN or other, the spill ID number, which is assigned to us by OSPR at the beginning of a spill, and then the method we're using to conduct our survey. So now we need to create our start point location. So as you can see at the bottom, it's orange. We need that to be green so we have the best accuracy for our GPS data point collection. So this collects our date and time timestamp as well as the GPS coordinates and accuracy of those coordinates. So then we can start collecting our actual data. So we can do a wildlife collection, wildlife captured preemptive capture, survey location, observation, oil sample, hazing, or trail camera. So I'll, we'll start with trail camera and I'll kind of run through this with you. So in the notes section, we can put the camera number. We can take pictures of the camera in the field. So we have a visual reference of where it's located. And then we can also enter in manually where that camera is located in reference to the spill area. Once you save it, it shows up as a data point in your survey list. 
So I'll run through a wildlife collection with you as well. We require a little bit of additional information like the taxa, so a bird, mammal, reptile, amphibian, fish. Um, a subtype, whether it's terrestrial, marine, or freshwater. Whether that individual is alive or dead. And then you can enter any additional information, whether you know the species or if there's any injuries. We can also take photos of that animal in the field. And then also scan the QR code that we assign it when we collect it. Once you scan it, it auto-populates into the QR code box. And this data point also generates a date and time timestamp as well as the GPS coordinates. So now I'll run through um, a hazing data point collection with you. So we'll select hazing from the drop down menu. We can then enter what type, whether it's auditory, visual, both or other. So in this case, we'll do auditory. And then we can enter any notes. So what type of hazing device it is. In this case, it's an AM FM radio. And then the location description for where we are placing our hazing device. And then we can take a photo. And once we save it, it'll also show up as a record in our survey. And I'll run through one other one, the observation data point with you all. So we'll select observation as our type. Then we can select the subtype of slick, tarball, wildlife observed, not captured, unoiled wildlife captured and released, and oiled wildlife rehabbed and released. So this is observed but not captured. And we'll take a picture. So once we save this record, it'll show up as a data point in the survey list. So finally, to end our survey, we'll need to create a survey end location point. So to do that, we will select survey location and it auto generates survey end. So it has the date, time and GPS coordinates and then it'll end our survey. So the really cool thing is that we can also view the map that we've created. So it tracks where you went and where you collected each thing. So the C is camera, the M is mammal, H is hazing, and O is observation. So you can click on each one of those and it'll give you a description of what you collected. And then to export this data to OSPR, we would hit export in the lower right. We have the option of emailing it to ourselves or transferring it to CDFW, or if for some reason the Wi-Fi is not working, we can do it via USB. Um, so if we want to transfer it, we would hit transfer, hit OK, and then we would enter in the password and hit OK, and then it would transfer that survey to the OSPR server where um, OSPR can access it and OWRM can access it. So this is an example of what a map looks like that OSPR has generated from some of our wildlife recovery app data. This is from a spill last year down in Camarillo. Um, and this just shows one of the surveys that we did and all the different types of collections we made um, while we were conducting that survey. So that's a basic overview of how the Wildlife Recovery app works and what kinds of information we use it for. Um, we're really excited about this app. It's been a really great tool for us in recent responses, and we're really excited to see how we can improve it for the future. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Oh. Once we open... Sorry. So does anyone have any questions for me on the Wildlife Once we open the app, we need to create our survey, <laughs> so we enter Repeating. the survey name. I'm going to move on. Uh, thank go. you, Jenny, because uh, we are running long here. Um, so um, what do we do with all this? Day? First of all, I want to kudos to my GIS team for, for developing these apps because um, they're, they're great. Uh, they save so much time and, 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 and they're so accurate compared to uh, the past. Okay, so um, ultimately, all of our data is going into Irma. That's, that's the, uh, the the cop of choice for uh, for California. Um, you know, the data we, we send out, we can send out KMLs, KMZs. Here's a, a, a big one, uh, SharePoint. It's really easy to uh, to just place files and and uh, and, uh, and uh, imagery just right up on a SharePoint site. And then 
people can get to it that way. So between Irma and SharePoint, uh, we're pretty sure that uh, most people uh, can get the information they need. Um, again, there's ArcGIS Online. Uh, here's an example of how the, that's Survey123 is used to create uh, a, a, um, a geographic response plan. Uh, this one is for the Kern River, which is actually a beautiful river. Uh, if you've only seen it from the Bakersfield side, you got to go upstream. Um, what's this? Uh, an otter spotter output. And some more maps uh, from the down. This is a KML or a KMZ file from, uh, from the wildlife app. Again, you see, you can click on these and you get all the information. Uh, we use Irma, SharePoint, questions, because uh, it's 11 o'clock and uh, we're pushing it here. So I'm going to stop my share back here. Are there any questions, Lindsay? Yes, we have a couple questions. They're specifically about how to access the Scatalog app. In one of them is uh, related to the iPhone versus iPad. Okay, it, it will not run on an iPhone. It will only run on an iPad. We use the Mini 4. It'll run on uh, anything larger than an iPhone. And that has to do with the amount of real estate on the screen. You just can't do scat on a little phone. Okay. And another one, uh, someone's having trouble f searching for the Scatalog app in the Apple Store. So um, is it? I, I would look for a CDFW. Okay. Try that search, CDFW, and it should pop up that way. 